Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. Some uh, on Zoom, maybe some of you are on your phone, but again, welcome to you all. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director uh, of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I want to say thank you to our board chair, Terry Doherty. Uh, we're recording the interview and we'll be making it available on our website, Facebook page, and those who are on our email listserv. To our Muslim friends, uh, Ramadan Mubarak, continued blessings to you all, continued blessed Ramadan to you all. <clears throat> We're, uh, um, uh, as part of our continuing series of interviews during this time of quarantine, we're very happy today to spend some time with Steve Sosabi, founder, president, and CEO of the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Uh, I'll repeat this information at the end of the interview, but if you would like to support PCRF, Palestine Children's Relief Fund, you can go to their website, pcrf.net, and there's a button there that you can click on, a link to uh, how you can contribute. <clears throat> Uh, Steve, welcome. It's very good to see you. Uh, you're speaking to us from your home in Ramallah under what is essentially a double occupation curfew, one because of the coronavirus and the other because of the Israeli occupation. Um, I understand that the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, Authority has been pretty proactive and so uh, relatively speaking, the number of cases of uh, COVID-19 has been relatively low uh, in uh, the West Bank and in Gaza so far. But really, let's just start the interview by asking you this. How are you and your family doing? Say a word about that. And how are things in Ramallah and throughout the West Bank? Oh, thank you, Michael. And thank you for having me. And I'm very honored and privileged to have this opportunity to speak with fellow Midwesterners. I'm from Ohio, your neighbor state. And um, just want to also express uh, uh, my uh, acknowledgement for our Muslim brothers and sisters who are fasting and uh, celebrating the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, to answer your question here in Palestine and where I live in Ramallah, um, the situation has been relatively um, under control compared to what you're experiencing in the United States, particularly on the uh, East Coast and what we've seen some of our uh, brothers and sisters in Italy and Spain and other countries go through. Um, the Palestinian Authority um, were very proactive when the first cases were identified in Bethlehem. They were um, some Greek tourists who were first identified with the virus in very early March and it only took a couple of days for the Palestinian Authority to basically close down the entire West Bank, close shops, close schools, close um, uh, all social activities, and that really helped to quell the potential spread of the COVID-19 virus here in Palestine. Um, the occupation, as you mentioned, Michael, is a double-edged sword. Of course, it's uh, destroying all aspects of Palestinian political, cultural, economic, and social life, but it also has, to some extent, particularly in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, provided some form of isolation and protection that we haven't seen in other parts of the world, particularly next door in Israel, where they have over well over uh, 12,000 cases now with uh, over 100 deaths. Here in Palestine, we have uh, within the Ministry of Health authority areas, uh, 390 uh, COVID cases with only 17 in the Gaza Strip and very few recently. And a lot of those, about one third were workers who came back from Israel. It's very hard to control the um, access back home. Uh, once yeah. they're so here with my family and with uh, uh, the situation here where we're working and where we're living, um, it's calm. We're still under quarantine. The schools are still closed. Um, but gradually the government is starting to slowly reopen and uh, permit people to gradually go back to normal life. It hasn't reached anywhere near what it was in February when before COVID came. But uh, it's gradually opening. In the northern part of the West Bank in Janine and Nablus, Tokatam area, uh, you can now reopen offices if they're small. Uh, you can um, also 
uh, some of the more smaller businesses are starting to reopen. But here in Ramallah, we're still under quarantine and uh, we're hoping that this will pre pre prevent the spread of this terrible disease and this terrible virus. Tell me, uh, um, what are, are there any precautions or any concerns about uh, uh, Ramadan iftar and about the gatherings after after uh, sundown and you know just large gatherings of people, uh, uh, extended families, et cetera? Are there any are there any particular restrictions from the Palestinian Authority about those gatherings for our Muslim yeah, mosques, mosques are closed. Uh, I live next to a mosque, so you might hear it. They just started their um, Tarawiyah prayer which is the prayer after iftar, about an hour after iftar. So, um, uh, but people are not going to the mosques. In fact, uh, for the first time, maybe in history, uh, the call to prayer is encouraging people to go, to stay home rather oh. than come to the mosque. They're actually saying that during the call to prayer, stay at home and pray, which is very unusual. It's, uh, as I said, I don't think any, and no one remembers that ever happening before. Yes. So the mosques are closed. Um, and I don't know, at least in here in the West Bank, if they are open, I'm sure they're following very strict protocols as far as distance to prayer and so on. And as far as I know, people are not socializing and um, participating in the traditional inviting over for Ramadan dinners or the socializing, which is very common and a very essential part of the month of Ramadan. So um, it's an unusual time for everyone. It's an unusual time in the Middle East because Ramadan is really uh, the most important time of the year for the vast majority of people in this region. Uh, but people are respecting uh, how dangerous and how um, potentially harmful this the spread of this disease is. And they're being encouraged by the religious leaders to not uh, socialize and not violate the protocols of, of social distancing. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Steve. That, that's an important update. I don't ever remember... Uh, uh the injunction to uh, stay home and pray during the call to prayer at all during the Adhan. Uh, yeah. Steve, for, for those of our listeners who are just beginning to learn about your work and PCRF, can you tell us about uh, the origins of the pediatric, pediatric cancer clinic in Bejala, uh, the other clinics that you have throughout the West Bank and the one you're building in Gaza? Just say, just say a little bit uh, about uh, PCRF for us. Do you want me to speak about the origins of the organization and the origins of those particular Well, why don't, you, why don't you do both? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll start from the beginning and it might be a little bit easier. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Ohio. I'm from a small town, Kent, Kent State. I'm sure most of you are familiar with our uh, unfortunate legacy during the Vietnam War when um, uh, National Guard's troops on May 4th in 1970 entered the university and killed four students. Um, and that is an anniversary that's coming up in a couple of days now. That's a small town I was raised in. And um, uh, I, that was before my time as far as being aware or being conscious of what was happening. I was only four years old at the time. But I was raised in a small town which had that legacy, that political legacy of uh, seeing uh, lethal force against peaceful protesters. And um, being raised in a college town and in the, the um, Western Reserve, which was historically a very progressive area in the uh, abolitionist movement, um, we still have that kind of political legacy for the most part uh, among the, um, the progressive population there. And as, um, as we discussed before we came on this program, I was raised by parents who were very progressive and believed in working for social justice and raised uh, their children, their five children, my four sisters and myself, Steve, um, I'll tell you what. Why, why don't you? Why don't? Why don't we hold that uh, uh, for a little later? Really about the origins of PCRF and uh, the, the clinic in, in Beit Jala. Maybe that's really where I wanted to go. If, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Sorry, it's always hard to know where to start when you start from the middle. It's kind of yeah. Taken no, a I hear you. But I'll, I'll stick with that uh, clinic. So we built the first pediatric oncology department and opened it on in April of 2013. And that department came about a result of uh, my first wife, Huda Al-Masri, who is from here in Ramallah, um, passing away in July of 2010 from leukemia. Uh, and me seeing firsthand her struggle and um, how terrible that disease was, although she was treated at one of the best centers in the country in Cleveland, 
she was not able to beat the disease. And I came back to Palestine to raise my two daughters here and to continue my work with the organization running the PCRF. But I also wanted to do something um, to honor her, to honor her legacy as a humanitarian. She was somebody who helped build the organization with me, but also to do something to help treat the kids here who are suffering from the same disease that took her life. So um, we worked with the Ministry of Health. We identified the Center of Oncology Services, which is in Bethlehem. And we agreed to build a pediatric department because at that time, there were no pediatric services at all in oncology in the entire West Bank. Every child who had cancer had to go out of the West Bank, which required uh, getting permission from the Israeli military. They would be separated from their families. It was costly, it was difficult, it was painful, and the care was fractured. So we built this department, we opened it in 2013, and for seven years now, it's been functioning and providing hundreds and hundreds of children with uh, cancer in the West Bank and kids from Gaza, free treatment they otherwise wouldn't get. And it's did in the name you, of my first wife. Did you uh, have a relationship at all with Augusta Victoria Hospital? Yeah, uh, Augusta Victoria Hospital is in East Jerusalem. It's on Mount Scopus. It's one of the best hospitals in Palestine. And they have a pediatric oncology program there as well. Unfortunately, uh, they are on the other side of the wall. And yeah. having act even though it is East Jerusalem and under international law, it is considered part of the Palestinian occupied territories. Um, the access for Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza to the Augusta Victoria Hospital is difficult. You're required to have a permit from the Israeli military, as I mentioned before, and those permits are quite frequently denied or issued uh, later than the patient needs to be treated. And often the treatment starts and then the next permit that is needed for follow-up care is not provided. So unfortunately, the care is very fractured. Uh, the center is excellent. The physicians there are excellent. We do cooperate with them and uh, support them. But unfortunately, with the occupation and the measures, that are being imposed by the Israeli military and the Israeli government, um, Palestinians need to have centers in the West Bank that can ensure a continuation of professional adequate care for their patients. The reason I asked you about Augusta Victoria is because uh, the, uh, the former Luther Wolf Federation rep in East Jerusalem, Mark Brown, is a very good friend. And uh, when he was there, we used to take a number of our groups to uh, Augusta Victoria and tour there and hear from Mark about the medical care there. So hopefully down the road, uh, I'll be able to be in touch with you and we can uh, tour your facility in Beit Jala and uh, hear from you and the people that you have working there about the work that you're doing in the cancer clinic there. We would love to have you. It's, we always welcome visitors. The pa parents love it, the staff love it, and most of all the children love to have visitors come and see um, and to, and to um, visit and to show a sense of solidarity and support for them. Good. Uh, at this point, uh, Steve, I want to invite one of our local pediatricians, Dr. Tony Giaquinta, to follow up with a couple of questions about the work of your cancer clinic. So Tony, uh, take it away. Gosh, Steve, it is so, uh, what an honor to be speaking with you. Um, uh, the things that you do are things that um, in my head are things that, boy, I wish I could do something like that. Um, and you've demonstrated that you can do it. And, and I have follow-up questions trying to fake, trying to wrap my head about how you've been able to accomplish so much with so many barriers, um, literal physical barriers um, that have been uh, in front of you. Um, my first question though is, is more of a, um, just something that I'd love your perspective on. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Paul Farmer. And one of the things he says is that the idea that some lives matter less than others is the root of all that is wrong in the world. And when I extrapolate that to how we treat children, some children with haves and some children with have nots, and the barrier for that feels to me like the big barometer to humanity. And when I look at our country and I see physical walls going up on the Mexico border and how we were separating families and the continued um, disparities, both um, racially and culturally in our country, I'm wondering how you look at our country um, and what you are seeing and the depth of inequity and disparity that you uh, see around you 
if you can kind of put your finger on the pulse of the United States and um, in our direction of social inequality. Yeah, I mean, that's such a, such a really broad and um, emotional question because our country's not what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago with the progressive kind of direction we were heading um, has just kind of been eroded through, I think, our capitalist structure, the media, what have you. And just looking at it from outside, I mean, I'm, I'm able to observe my country, the United States, um, from far away. And what I see is very disturbing and scary for, for all of us. And you see it even with this COVID issue where there's so many voices now coming out and saying, well, we can sacrifice uh, the older generation for our economy. You know, I know the, um, I think the uh, attorney governor, or the um, whatever you call him from Texas came out and said that I'm willing to sacrifice myself and the older folks in our society because our economy is more important. And when you put profit, you put money, you put, um, uh, you know, materialism over the lives of human beings, that's not a society that I believe I want to raise my children in. And that's not the society that our forefathers fought and died for. So it's scary. It's scary when we have a leadership that kind of tries to separate us and um, creates this fear mongering sense of um, us against them when we're all one society and we're all one people on this planet. And the only way we're going to get through these huge challenges, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's the environmental issues, whether it's the income inequality and the disparities between the wealth and classes is by working together and um, putting aside fear and putting aside if I, I have to have mine, otherwise they'll take it from me. And it comes from our leadership and it comes from our um, system, our corrupt system, I'm sorry to say. And, you know, where is it going? We don't know. We just have to keep struggling. Those of us who believe in social justice, those of us who believe in freedom and equality and um, want to get rid of these systems of inequality that exist in our society, we have to keep struggling and we have to, have to keep working. And your group, your organization here tonight is a perfect example of that. And Palestine is a litmus test, in my opinion, of anyone who believes in justice. You cannot say I am a progressive person who believes in justice and freedom and not stand with the Palestinians. Just as you can't say those things and not stand with the imprisoned uh, people on the borders of, uh, of our Mexican uh, brothers and sisters. So um, it's a scary time in history. It's a scary time in our country's history but I believe eventually we will overcome because I believe in the good of our, of our country and these policies and these uh, institutions of injustice never, never sustain themselves. They always are smashed or erode from their corrupt interior. It's just a question of when and how. Thank you. Tony, you wanna to follow up with another question? Uh... Um, gosh, that was so beautifully put. Um, I think my, you know, maybe to just speak specifically about the Cancer Institute, um, you know, in, in our, in the United States, um, the ability to pay is, is always a tragedy for the haves versus the have nots. Um, for children, um, there's a lot of insurance um, uh, benefits that are afforded to children like our uh, um, CHIP program, as well as an expanding Medicaid um, program for children. I was, I guess I'm wondering how the ability to pay is an access barrier um, for an expensive treatment center like a cancer institute um, that you're, you've established. That's a great question. And uh, there is no barrier to pay here in Palestine. They have a system of health, government health insurance so um, we only work in the government sector here, not because we're in love with uh, the inefficiencies that come with any government institution, but because that's where the poor people go to have access to care. So um, our only uh, purpose is to ensure that those who don't necessarily have access because of their economic situation, or their political circumstances here in the West, God, whatever services we provide, we provide it for free. And that, whether that's in our cancer department, the families don't pay, they're all provided free care through the government. 
or through the other services. So I don't know if you know this, but we bring about 150 medical teams here a year from all over the world and do a wide variety of operations, whether it's orthopedics, whether it's neurosurgery, whether it's open heart surgery on children. Our teams come and they operate for free in government hospitals. And that's why, Tony, you're welcome to come as a pediatrician. We would love to have you. Um, and by the way, my we're second working, wife- We're working on him. We're working on him, Steve. Okay. I, I mean, this this has <laughs> just opened my eyes to um, what I really need the second half of my life to look like. So boy, what a great invitation. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Once sorry, sorry. I, but I wanted to just get that invitation into Tony. Yeah. Well, I'll second it, Tony. We would love to have you here. And I was just going to finish and say, so my first wife, as I mentioned, passed away from leukemia. I remarried a pediatric oncologist who's here on the ground and uh, very much involved in our oncology services. Uh, and she would, as also, she's a pediatrician, so she would be a good person for you to communicate with and see how we could use your skills and your services. And there's plenty, plenty need for pediatricians to come and help train and help provide uh, treatment for patients as well. But just to, to go back, the, there isn't an inequality of health services here like there is in the United States. There is a disparity between the government and private, but for the most part, anybody who needs specialized care can get it through um, either our organization providing it or the government ensuring that people have uh, nas uh, socialized medicine. Do you, wanna, uh, do you wanna say a word about uh... Uh, Zena, uh, you said you spirited her away from Sloan Kettering. I mean, uh, why don't you say a word about her and what she does specifically on the ground in, in Palestine? Well, I met her at an, an event for our organization uh, several years ago and was speaking about our department, which we opened in 2013 that I, I mentioned. And they were, I was talking about how, like I did today, how there was a lack of care. An organization tries to plug these in, uh, defects in the uh, public health sector by identifying where there is a need to build services and then build them, usually through infrastructure, but also by training and in medical equipment. So when I was speaking about oncology services, she was in the audience as a pediatric oncologist. Her family is originally from Sudan. She speaks Arabic. So she was very interested to come and, uh, and volunteer with us. She was at that time finishing her fellowship at Sloan Kettering in New York. So once she finished, um, and you know, we started to have a relationship. And once we got married, she came here with me and um, started uh, leading the uh, medical side of training the doctors and supporting the development of the department we opened in Gaza because we opened another oncology department in Gaza and the one we opened in the West Bank in 2013. So actually we built two pediatric oncology departments um, and she's been very much involved in that. She's now working here as a consultant with St. Jude's from Memphis trying to consolidate and organize all of the pediatric oncology services in Palestine and, um, and is doing a good job, although it's very challenging given the uh, logistical restrictions that everyone has now, but she's leading that process. Good, uh, thanks Steve. Uh, Tony, thank you. Um, I wanna um, uh, alert our uh, folks who are gathered with us that there'll be an opportunity to ask Steve uh, questions in just a few minutes, although we've had some Zoom chat bombs to begin our program. <laughs> we're still going to try to use we're still going to try to use the chat function to ask questions. So I'll be monitoring the chat function uh, in, uh, in uh, as we go along here. But uh, I want to just call on Ron Caldwell. Uh, Ron's a board member, a local activist in Fort Wayne and Allen County, as well as uh, um, uh, a retired orthopedist. Who wants to ask you the question about, uh, I think, about your folks? So, Ron, you want to jump in here and ask? Yes. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, like we talked before we went on air, please continue um, with telling about your childhood and your progressive parents and, and uh, what their uh, example has meant to you and continues to mean to you. I, uh, as I was saying, when I read your uh, biography, that really um, that really struck me mainly because, as I was saying, I have I have uh, my oldest son and daughter-in-law and their four kids that's been living with us for the last happened to visit when we canceled our spring break trip and they've been with us for five weeks or whatever it's been now. So uh, I'm, I was just struck about how important it is for us to mentor our kids and our grandkids and how much 
it can affect their lives forever. So I want to so continue with what you were saying with your about your parents and their their progressive ideas. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm sorry I didn't mean to like preempt your question, so I apologize. No, um, that's all right. So um, yeah, well, my father's an extraordinary man. He was raised in North Carolina um, in the '40s. He was born in the in the uh, '30s. So he um, was brought up without you know, electricity from a very poor family. And like many Southerners moved to the North, uh, his family moved to the North during the Second World War for work. And his father moved to work in the rubber factories in Akron uh, for Goodyear. And uh, he came from a Baptist background and um, extremely limited with education his family was. And also um, at that time, uh, the family of his was very racist. And he, changed, he came and grew up in Akron and um, became the opposite of his family. He's the first one to graduate from high school, first one to go to college, and embraced a much more enlightened kind of political philosophy through his own initiative. Um, and uh, raised us very, and my mother as well, to believe very strongly in social justice and to believe very strongly and it's our obligation and responsibility to work for the uh, oppressed, particularly those who are oppressed by, uh, by ourselves by our government, by our systems, by our society. And um, I can remember, um, you know, my earliest memories was uh, at a campaign rally for George McGovern in 1972. And, um, uh, and also, you know, as, as you mentioned before we went on air, um, my father, we were at, a, at that time, he was a high school teacher. And uh, we were living in a town called Cuyahoga Falls, which is near Akron, which was 100% white. And uh, at that time, African-Americans were not able to purchase property in Akron or in Cuyahoga Falls, excuse me. Um, they were prevented through uh, all of the methods that were used at that time. And in some cases, even today in some society, in some areas to prevent uh, minorities from purchasing homes. So my father was very active in trying to desegregate our town and believe it was an injustice that people based on the pigmentation of their skin were not able to purchase property. Um, and that kind of act, activism on his part led uh, to our family receiving death threats. Our home was actually shot at. We had, uh, my sisters were um, escorted to elementary school by the police. And we moved to Kent a couple years later. My father decided he would rather raise his kids in a much more progressive uh, town. And being a college town, Kent, uh, Ohio, was much more enlightened and much more open. And that's where I grew up. Um, but at the same time, being brought up in Kent, I also had, we always had that kind of legacy of what happened in 1970 with the guardsmen killing four students. Um, you know, that's a, that kind of separated me from, I think, a lot of different um, small towns in the Midwest, which uh, maybe are a bit more conservative politically than, than I was raised. And um, that kind of opened my eyes uh, in the late 70s and early 80s when I was in high school. Um, I, you know, apartheid, the resistance to the, um, apartheid regime in South Africa was a very important issue that I read a lot about um, the support of the death squads in El Salvador and the uh, support of the Contras in Nicaragua was something our government was doing under Ronald Reagan. Um, and all of these things were uh, issues which I believe very strongly our government was morally and legally uh, violating the basic tenets of our democracy. Uh, so when I went to Kent State, I, I'm, my parents were, you know, high school teacher, a nurse. Um, I was, we were generally a working class family for the most part. Uh, I worked my way through college and at that time I was very active and um, believed very strongly in working for social justice. And the first Palestinian uprising began when I was a, um, a, a junior in college. And I just remember thinking, seeing the images of Israeli soldiers shooting unarmed Palestinians were the exact same images of Ohio National Guardsmen shooting anti-war protesters in 1970, exactly the same. And that connected to me more than it probably would have connected to a college student in Fort Wayne, Indiana, simply because I grew up in a town where that happened. So I um, started to uh, read a lot about the issue and it doesn't take much if you have an objective open mind on this issue and you're not clouded by kind of your ethnic or religious prejudices to see that what happened to the Palestinians was the same injustice that was happening in South Africa, the same injustice that had happened to the native population of, of our country. 
Um, but it was happening with our tax money. It was happening with the support of our political elite and even our media elite. So um, I became active at the university in trying to educate fellow Americans about these things and um, found myself uh, with the opportunity in December of 1988, the first anniversary of the first year of the first intifada. And I was able to go with a group of nine other college activists through the ADC, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. They were sending over groups to see firsthand what was actually happening in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, so this was my first trip uh, to the Middle East. And uh, for three weeks during Christmas break of 1988, December, um, we lived with Palestinian families. We toured the West Bank. We met with Israeli peace activists. We saw Israeli settlements. We saw what life was like uh, in the occupied territories. We saw the extremely brutal and harsh measures that the Israelis were using to try to quell this popular grassroots uprising. But we also saw the courage and the hope and the humanity of the Palestinian people. And that's what changed my life, was meeting these people who had endured such brutal um, oppression and at the hands of, uh, you know, basically my government, because we were bankrolling it, we were providing the military aid, we we're providing the political coverage for the Israelis to commit these uh, violations of human rights uh, and violations of international law. So, you know, I was uh, culpable. I, I'm an American citizen. I pay my taxes. Um, but these people treated me with such kindness and humanity. And all they wanted was for me to go back home and share their story with the American people because they believed, which is true, that if Americans know what really was happening here in Palestine, they wouldn't tolerate it. They wouldn't accept it. And that's true today. And I mean, you guys are all a perfect example of that. I, I see most of you are, are not Palestinian, as far as I can tell. So um, all of us share, I think, the same common um, values, which is that an injustice, whether it's committed against Palestinians or against Jews in, uh, in Europe in the uh, mid 20th century or to anybody is an injustice that we have to stand and, and work against and fight against. Um, and so I came back and finished my university and um, came back to work here as a journalist to share these stories. I wanted to write about the people I met. I wanted to um, talk about and to give Americans a chance to see firsthand or to hear about somebody who was on the ground here firsthand um, sharing stories that hopefully would resonate with them. Human stories, not political kind of discussions about negotiations or things like that, but just everyday people who are just trying to educate their kids or go to work or live normal lives and were being denied the basic rights of that we in our country enjoyed without even thinking twice about it. Um, and that's how I got started. And th there's more to that story, but uh, I got those values from my parents. And I particularly admire my father because he came from, you know, the deep south at a time when segregation was part of the legacy, was part of the heritage, and he changed completely um, and raised me with completely different values. Powerful story, Steve, uh, and uh, um, very moving. I mean, uh, it's it's the personal nature of it. You know, uh, uh, it's about relationships. It's about conversion, change. Uh, and I, I, it touches us very deeply. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. And Ron, thank you for asking the question. Uh, one of our good friends here in Fort Wayne, uh, an OBGYN, uh, has asked the question about uh, uh, the challenges about providing care in Gaza. It seems like they're just so great. H how? Uh, do I remember correctly, just at the end of 2019, you were in Gaza, you were traveling there at the time. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Gaza, about your project in Gaza, and about the challenges of providing care in Gaza. Yeah, so Gaza is a place that I try to go to as frequently as possible, and I, I need a permit from the Israeli military. So I'm not always issued a permit to go to Gaza as frequently as I would like to go, but I try to go once or twice a month and um, I have been going, as I mentioned, I went first in December of 1988. And at that time, I don't know how many people remember during the first intifada, Gaza was under curfew every single night That's right. from 8, 8 p.m. till 6 a.m. So I can remember being in Gaza at a time when everybody was trying to get home as quickly as possible um, because it was a shoot on site curfew and everybody was quite afraid of, of being on the streets past eight o'clock. Um, so, yeah, I was in Gaza in, I think even in January, if I remember correctly. And um, we have three offices there. We have a staff of about 15. 
uh, people who are field workers, social workers. Uh, we have our you know, organizational infrastructure on the ground in Gaza, and we do a variety of different types of programs there. We brought about 70 volunteer surgery and medical teams into Gaza last year from all over the world, as far away as New Zealand, Australia, uh, most of the European countries, and North and South America, who provide, as I mentioned before, a variety of different free surgical services for children and training for local doctors, in addition to building the cancer department and a variety of other humanitarian relief services. We provide you know, food and medicine for orphans. We do every week a sponsorship program for kids who we identify through field work. So Gaza in itself is a very unique challenge because it's completely cut off. The, the United Nations has called it uh, the world's largest open air prison. They also mentioned that by 2020, which is this year, it would become unlivable. It's 70% refugees. Uh, the same proportion, 70% of the population live on less than $2 a day. And now it's worse than ever because the economy has closed down. Um, the import exports, which is extremely limited to begin with, is virtually non-existent and people are just subsiding there basically through the support of the international community. It's unsustainable. Uh, the risk of this virus infecting Gaza, which is so densely populated, is one of the most extreme and serious risks in the world today for the COVID uh, coronavirus spread. So that's why um, this kind of open air prison has benefited the Palestinians during this virus because there's only two entry points. There's the Egyptian border and there's the border with Israel. So they can be closely monitored. You can uh, evaluate every single person who enters and ensure and, and quarantine them, which is what the Palestinians have been doing. Everybody who enters Gaza goes immediately into quarantine. And our organization has been providing uh, food for those people who are in quarantine. We provide infection control material, hygiene kits, and other support to help them get through this period and to ensure that the COVID virus spread doesn't happen in Gaza because it would be an enormous catastrophe for, for everyone. You know, um, one of the things that, I mean, it's pleasantly surprising to me, you refer to it, but we expected that there'd be just an explosion of COVID cases in Gaza uh, a few weeks ago. And yeah. the fact that there hasn't been, at least as far as we know, is really one of the one of the most pleasant surprises up to this point uh, for me and for us activists here in this country. Um, is there a particular reason? Can you put your finger on it? Uh, why there might not be? There's two reasons. Uh, one is Gaza is a young population. Over 50% of the population is under the age of 16 years old. And as you know, the coronavirus uh, is most risk is most dangerous for people who are over 60. Um, so that's one factor. But the bigger factor is what I mentioned before. There's two entry points into Gaza and the Palestinian Authority controls who enters into both of those entry points. And what they've been doing is taking every single person who comes into Gaza since the coronavirus first began to, uh, to emerge here in Palestine. Every single person who came into Gaza uh, has been monitored and has been quarantined. And that's how they've been able to control the, um, the spread so far. Now, how long that can continue um, you know, until there's a vaccine is the biggest question because it, this seems to be an unsustainable policy. Uh, eventually they have to open or lessen some of the restrictions on uh, people coming in and going out. But for now, that's what's controlled the spread and uh, prevented the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus in Gaza. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have a question from one of our uh, esteemed priests uh, here in, in Fort Wayne. Uh, um, he asks um, about, uh, about the reduction, has there been any reduction in the number of Palestinian youth who are incarcerated? I know that there's a real concern uh, uh, from our friends at Defense for Children International about the spread of corona cases among the prison populations. And this is a question about Palestinian youth who are incarcerated. Yeah, so um, this is actually a very serious issue because the imprisonment of Palestinian youth in Israeli jails, who are, they're political prisoners, they're resisting occupation, um, has been a source of uh, debate. First of all, the Israelis don't consider them to be political prisoners. They consider them to be criminals and try to treat them as such. But from the Palestinian perspective and from the interpretation of international law, they should be treated separately than from uh, people who are committing uh, economic or social crimes. Uh, there are thousands of youths in Israeli prisons from the West Bank and Gaza Strip, many of them without trial, 
uh, a lot of them without the due process of law. And the risk of the coronavirus spreading in these prisons because they are so densely packed and not provided uh, a lot of the um, same kind of uh, basic uh, hygiene and sanitary support that, uh, that they would get outside. That's one of the big risks. Now we don't have exact information as to what's happening inside these prisons. The families who usually provide the best source of information are not having access. They're not permitted to visit their relatives uh, for nearly six weeks now. And that's made it very difficult to get exact information as to what's happening inside these early prisons. Um, I, I have a question about your fundraising, but I wanna sneak one more question in here. Tell us about uh, um, uh, the kids who need extra specialized care that maybe you can't offer in Palestine itself. Uh, you bring them to the US, you bring them to other places around the world. Talk to us about that part of your program. Yeah, so that's actually how the organization started. When I was working as a journalist in 1989 and 1990, um, during the first intifada, I met a boy from the West Bank who had had his legs and his hand blown off from a bomb. He was only 10 years old. And I, be, I did a story about him and I also befriended him and his family. And I felt very sad for, you know, this boy was in a wheelchair. He was a triple amputee. And uh, at the same time, he had such a beautiful spirit. He was full of life. He was, uh, you know, uh, just, it was amazing to see a child so with so much positive energy, despite having bandages on the stumps of what was once his legs. And when I went back to Ohio, I had to go back to work. What I used to do is uh, I would go and work to save my money as a landscaper um, uh, through the spring and summer and fall. And then during the winter, uh, I would go after I would save my money, I would go over to Palestine and work as a journalist. Well. I met this boy in the winter uh, of uh, 1990, and then I came back to Kent and to start working as a landscaper. I'd run out of money. And um, I took a photograph of this boy and showed it to an orthopedic surgeon in Akron and asked him if he could help this boy. And the surgeon agreed. He said, sure, I, you know, I, I think I can make some phone calls and see if we could, uh, if you can bring him over, uh, I'm sure we could get him walking again. And I had never, you know, done anything like that before. I just wanted to help this boy on a one-on-one -on -one basis. When he told me that, I was very enthusiastic and I went to some friends at the university, some graduate students who are Palestinians or uh, people who are sympathetic. And I told them, you know, I have this boy who is a triple amputee and I'd like to bring him over and get him treatment. And we all kind of brainstormed and pooled our money together and um, were able to get this boy and his sister who was also injured over to Akron uh, in, uh, in May of 1990. And since then, those are the first two injured Palestinian kids to ever come to the United States for free medical care. Within a few months, both of them had their surgeries, went back home walking again. And when people saw them coming back home to their families, um, it did a lot of different things. First of all, it got these kids care they couldn't get in Palestine. Um, it enabled the community in the United States to be involved. They stayed with host families. A lot of people in Northeast Ohio heard about them and gave them the support they needed to get the treatment and, the, um, and to get through those several months away from their families. It also exposed them to Americans who didn't have any idea what was happening in Palestine. They were on the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, of the Akron Beacon Journal, several local wow. news stations covered their stories. And this is exactly why I became a journalist. I wasn't a journalist because I wanted to make a career out of it. I was a journalist because I wanted to show Americans what was happening to the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So bringing those kids to the United States did exactly what I couldn't do as a journalist. Um, they were being exposed to Americans who needed to know how our tax money was being spent. And then the fourth thing was for me personally, on a spiritual level, gave me a sense of fulfillment and um, purpose. Um, by helping these kids who, who needed the uh, treatment. Um, as a young man, it, it set a course in my life that um, I found very rewarding. So when they went back home, people heard about them and started bringing other kids to me who needed treatment. And I started finding that there were a lot of American hospitals who would take these kids for free. And that's one of the positive things of our health system is that CEOs of hospitals can make decisions as to whether they wanna accept a child for free or not. Whereas if I do it in Europe, it's, you have to go through a very bureaucratic government system. So I started contacting hospitals all over the country with these kids who needed treatment and finding them uh, free care and then putting them in the communities, the Palestinian communities in Houston or Los Angeles or Boston or Chicago, wherever I could find treatment for them. 
And that's how I decided to start a nonprofit because I went around to all of the existing organizations at that time in Washington and DC who were uh, affiliated with this cause and asked them if they would be willing to sponsor bringing Palestinian kids over for free care. And most of them didn't have that in their mandate or didn't see that this is something that could be done. So I had to start my own nonprofit to do that, uh, to facilitate the visas, to facilitate the plane tickets and things like that. And that's how we got started. And since then, we've sent over 2000 kids for free medical care, um, mostly in the United States. I'd say like 85% have been in the United States. We do a, a few of them in uh, Europe, some of them in uh, the Middle East, like the Emirates and, um, and Turkey but most of them go to the United States for free care. We have a girl right now in Chicago and a boy in Dallas. And we just sent two kids back to Gaza three days ago. Um, it was a challenge because of the uh, COVID virus, but um, that's one of the cornerstones of our organization is arranging free care for kids who can't get it here. Are you still in touch with those original kids? Most of them, most of them. I'm, I'm friends on Facebook with kids who now have kids themselves. And some of their kids are older than my kids. So um, yeah, it's, it's very rewarding to see them grow up and to have lives and, um, and you know, to feel like all of the effort and sacrifice that was made uh, was worth it. We have a question from Sammy Jatan, uh, 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 really thanking you for your inspiring talk, Steve, but asking how have your fundraising, fundraising strategies changed as a result of COVID? And what are you requesting of your supporters? I was going to come to this at the end, but we might as well ask you now, are there any particular initiatives that uh, our funds might help to support? Uh, uh, do you have, uh, how, and how have your fundraising strategies changed because of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Sammy. Um, well, our organization's foundation and our core operations are bringing volunteer medical teams in, which we can't do anymore during the COVID virus pandemic because of the restrictions on travel and the risk to the population of infection. Sending kids outside for free care, which I just spoke about, is also something we have to put on hold during this current uh, crisis because people cannot travel and it's also a risk for the kids to be infected or to bring the infection back. So our main, the third pillar of our organization is humanitarian projects and humanitarian relief. So. Um, that's really where our focus is right now, which is identifying at-risk communities and providing them the services, whether it's food. We have a big campaign for refugee camps in Lebanon right now, Palestinian camps where um, people are suffering from even more harsh conditions than they suffer from here in Palestine because of their statelessness in, um, uh, in Lebanon as Palestinians and the political crisis that Lebanon's been going under uh, historically, but even since October, where the government has uh, um, been in a state of kind of a crisis. Uh, we're providing food and infection and hygiene kits for the refugee camps there, here in Palestine and in Jordan as well. And here in Palestine, we've been doing a variety of different types of relief efforts, big ones like providing uh, x-ray machines for the Ministry of Health in Gaza to help them shore up their um, the response to the COVID virus. And then on a community level, we've been providing PPEs to healthcare for workers, infection control materials to at-risk communities, to elderly homes. Um, we've been providing food and uh, other types of humanitarian support uh, to communities that are marginalized. Uh, so we've been very active in our fundraising strategy is to raise money to deal with right now the coronavirus and to keep some of our core programs in the humanitarian projects running, which are the sponsorship programs for orphans, for chronic children with chronic medical conditions that need continuous support. We have a program that continues in that regard. Um, but for now, our main focus is trying to ensure that um, people are able to um, deal with this virus, that the communities where that are most at risk uh, are provided the basic essentials um, to help prevent the spread, the healthcare workers have the necessary materials to protect themselves and to protect their patients and to support the Ministry of Health as much as we can. Yeah, uh, I'm, thanks, Steve. I, I'm glad you just mentioned this because it was one of the questions I was going to ask you, and that is uh, about uh, the orphans, orphanages. Um, uh, I know how difficult it is for people to adopt in a predominantly Muslim culture, uh, and so orphanages Oftentimes, uh, babies are left uh, with uh, particular homes. Oftentimes, they're associated with religious orders 
uh, are, are with churches. But can you say a little bit more about your work with, uh, are you connected with particular orphanages or is it only when kids are brought to the clinics? Uh, tell us just a little bit more about that part of your work. Yeah, so the orphan project that we have is only in Gaza. And these are mostly kids who were made orphans as a result of the war in 2014. Oh, okay. Um, where a huge number of civilians were killed and left a lot of children without parents. So we are providing those. Now, those are kids who generally live with extended families. It's not so much a religious issue as it is an Arab culture issue. So um, because the Arabs have such strong family foundations and extended families tend to care for each other's children, um, when there is a loss of a parent, the rest of the fam extended family take that child in. So it's very, usually kids who live in orphanages are a result of um, out of wedlock births, um, children with significant health issues or birth defects that the families can't take care of. Um, very rarely is a result of um, just the death of a parent or both parents in which the child is abandoned. That's very rare. Um, nonetheless, we don't necessarily um, uh, we don't necessarily cooperate or work with any particular orphanage. We do, however, support orphan orphanages by providing them the essential aid. So, uh, just a few days ago, I was in the uh, Tolkadam, a town in the West Bank, where we were delivering uh, humanitarian aid for um, uh, uh, an orphanage that had been uprooted because the in quarantine, uh, the government had used the orphanage to put people with COVID uh, symptoms in, and they put the orphans in another place. So we went to the other place to make sure the kids had the proper support and assistance. But in general, to answer your question, our work is in the health sector. We provide some orphanages basic humanitarian support when needed, but for the most part, um, it's just when kids need medical care or surgery, we definitely provide it for free for them. I want you to put your uh, uh, activist hat on. I know you can never take it off, so uh, that's part of what you're doing with your medical care. Uh, but. Uh, um, we know that despite the restrictions on movement and uh, and gathering that's being enforced against both Israelis and Palestinians, the Israeli occupation forces are continuing to demolish homes, conduct night raids to arrest kids and young men, particularly uh, illegal Israeli settlers are uprooting olive trees, creating new illegal outposts in the Jordan Valley, and now. Uh, annexation, we hear that word more and more now, annexation be, is being pursued by the, the new slash old Israeli government with United States, with the United States blessing. Say a little bit about uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, what's happening on the ground in terms of the Israeli occupation and how that's continuing. And also uh, the annexation that's about that, that's being talked about, and about how that's impacting your work. Well, it's not it's not impacting our work in so much that um, you know we're here on the ground. We have our kind of organizational infrastructure all over the West Bank and Gaza. We're a humanitarian organization. Um, we provide surgical and medical and humanitarian aid. So. Um, we're working and we've been working under the most extreme and challenging circumstances, including two intifadas um, and um, some of the extreme measures of closure and restrictions that have been imposed by the Israeli government for years. So as a humanitarian organization, we do our best to kind of overcome these restrictions or these challenges and to continue to reach the people. But all of the issues that you've mentioned have been going on for years, the settlements, the annexation, the uprooting, the night raids, the imprisonment of, of Palestinians. This is nothing that's uh, a new phenomena here. It's been going on since the occupation began. So um, we've managed to build an organization that's functioning here on the ground despite these terrible political conditions. Um, and we're going to continue to do our work on a humanitarian level despite these conditions, because our focus is to uh, reach people who need help and give them the help that they need. Obviously, when you're talking about annexation of uh, land, um, which is uh, owned by people who don't have equal rights, 
Um, we don't know where that's leading. We don't know how that's going to result in a new intifada, a new uprising, a new round of bloodshed or violence or uprooting of the Palestinians from their homeland. Nobody knows. But what we do know is it will not lead to peace and a settlement of this historical crisis, that it will only lead to further turmoil and conflict and suffering on, the, on the, both sides, particularly on the Palestinian side. So we hope that this annexation talk was only talk, that it won't actually happen, that cooler and wiser heads will prevail. It's not in Israel's interest to annex uh, uh, Palestinian land without first reaching a settlement with the Palestinians that gives them equality and, uh, and national identity. But unfortunately, um, this is the reality that we have to live and work under. I did want to mention, and I forgot to say that, and um, uh, that to answer Sammy's question about our fundraising strategy, one more thing I wanted to say, not to veer off of your question, Michael, but no, just because sure. I wanted, uh, the strategies also change because in the United States, as a grassroots organization, we do depend on uh, a lot of uh, our chapters, and we have over 30 chapters in the United States doing events. And during the month of Ramadan, we do a lot of events where our communities raise money that enable us to do our work on the ground here. And we've had to cancel all of those events over the last couple of months. Um, and that's prevented us from raising the money that we generally would raise from our communities. Um, and that's been a big challenge for us. We don't know how we're going to uh, um, replace those fun lost funds. Um, but that's how we're trying. We're trying our best online to have a virtual fundraising event, to step up our online donations. But uh, obviously, this is a big challenge that we've never had to go through before, and we hope that we can. That this is a temporary situation, but right now it doesn't look like that's the case. Yeah, there were a number. I was going to mention that there were a number of fundraising events that you had to cancel, and you were also supposed to appear here in Fort Wayne last week, uh, yeah. and of course you're stranded. I, maybe that's too strong a word, but you're you're having to remain. Uh, in your home in Ramallah? I'm stranded. Like the bridge is closed. <laughs> if I wanted to leave now, I couldn't leave. Um, so stranded is a fair word to use. Um, so yeah, it's until the situation changes. I, re I appreciated your comments about Gaza. You know, we had Mads Gilbert here uh, a few years back and that's been, uh, that's still his talk uh, about his medical work there uh, during the uh, uh, during a couple of the incursions of the Israeli military, uh, really touched the hearts of a number of our people, and they still talk about it today. So I know that the eyes of Fort Wayne and the eyes of many of us activists here in the U.S. turn toward Gaza, particularly in addition to the broader West Bank. So, well, I'm Michael, let me let me interrupt you. I apologize for interrupting you, but I just want to say two things to that. First of all. Mads Gilbert is a good friend of mine and to our organization, all of his missions now to Gaza is through PCRF. And we're very honored and privileged to have a man of his stature and his uh, moral integrity uh, doing his great work on the ground in Gaza. Teaching and training first aid and emergency response to medical students there has saved the lives of countless uh, people. And secondly, um, thank you for saying that about Gaza. Uh, Gaza is the forgotten struggle in the world today and what's happening to the people in Gaza is uh, unacceptable on a moral level and on a human level. And the fact that those 2 million people have kept their dignity and their humanity and shown the world um, courage in the face of such brutal oppression has given me so much um, inspiration in my life. And it's an honor to be able to serve the people in Gaza. Uh do I understand from you, uh, Steve? Uh, I was under the impression that Mads wasn't allowed uh, back into Gaza. Are you saying that he's now allowed back in through PCRF and he's doing training? Well, we, we sponsor his missions, but the permission that he gets to enter Gaza is through the Israeli government. We don't have the authority to give permission sure. for people to go to Gaza. But yeah, he goes to our organization. And, and so uh, he, he's able to get back in now I mean, the Israelis yeah. are giving him permission to get back in now, I guess is my question. Over the last uh, year and a half to two years, uh, he's been able to get permission. Okay, thanks. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a real dear friend of ours from the Seattle area who's been an activist for many years, who's Palestinian herself. And Huda, uh, welcome. Huda, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? 
Uh, we're trying to, we're, yeah, go ahead, Huda, ask it just right, right out. Can you hear me? We can, Huda, please go ahead. Good. Steve, it's lovely to meet you, albeit virtually. Uh, I heard so much about you from my son, Bryce. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you, um, how, how much have you been, or how much have legislators been exposed to you? Oh, thank you. Okay. So did you get the question, Steve? Yeah, I think she asked how much legislators have been exposed to. Yes, to meet. have you been able to meet with, with any at all? Thank you, Huda, very much. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question, Huda. First of all, two things. Uh, Huda, your son Bryce is a dear friend of mine. I knew her son before I started PCRF. Uh, back in the first intifada, her son Bryce and I were here in Palestine as very young men a long time ago. Um, and he's a great guy. And I saw him in San Francisco a few months ago. And Huda, you did a great job as his mother. You should be very proud of Bryce. He's uh, He's someone I look to with much uh, affection. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I have not had much exposure to legislators. I kind of have, I'm not sure how important that is. I mean, it is important, obviously. We want our elected officials to be aware of what's happening and to have a kind of a conscious view of the reality of what uh, the uh, Israelis are doing here in the occupied territories. Um, but I've never been able to get access or really uh, focus on going to Washington and sitting with them. My work has always been building the organization and focusing on the day-to-day -day operations of running PCRF. Um, however, I do recognize the importance of reaching out to uh, legislators, and that would be something that probably in the future I should give more attention to and more effort towards. Um, I'm a little bit cynical. I kind of feel like I think they all kind of know, but um, they are also under a lot of stress and pressure to not be fair and balanced on the issue of Palestine for uh, what could be a reprisal on the part of APAC and others. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to knock on their doors and give them um, a firsthand view of what's going on here. And if that's something that I would be valuable in doing, I would be happy to do it. You know, I'm, I, I've always believed the very same thing, Steve, that, that uh, Congress was uh, occupied territory. But, uh, but I'm just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm having to reevaluate uh, our own thinking on this just because of the Betty McCollum uh, activism and uh, uh, the other kinds of uh, signatures she's getting on, on uh, uh, um, her letters, you know, to uh, fellow representatives, uh, Defense for Children International's role, the, the role of the American friends, you know, and uh, no way to treat a child. So especially with kids and, you know, your work with kids and, and your work with kids who are, who are sick, who have health issues, that might resonate in, in this present political environment with at least uh, a, a few dozen of the representatives in the halls of Congress. So it's worth a thought, you know? Yeah. The, the other side of that, the other side of that. Okay, uh, the other side of that coin, Michael, is that um, you could bring, you know, the, we exist here on this, uh, unfortunately, Israelis could easily stop giving permits for our doctors to go to Gaza. Yeah. And stop giving permits for our kids to leave for medical care. And we don't want to do anything that would prevent us from saving the lives of um, sick and uh, injured children here. So as soon you know, as you move from a humanitarian organization to political advocacy, you're really risking the work you're already doing. Is that is that the point you're making? I mean, yeah, that's that is the point. And yeah. I understand 100% what Huda's saying, and I agree with her. 
you know, we need to make a stronger effort to reach out. But there are a lot of people doing that. Yeah. And we don't want to endanger our um, uh, our organization's work here on the ground by bringing uh, the wrath of the Israeli military or government down upon us. Yes, yeah, that that's important. Uh, we're winding, we're we're coming to to a close here, Steve. I, I want to ask you to just say one more word. You alluded to this work earlier, but your work outside of the West Bank in Lebanon and Jordan, you mentioned. Uh, do you want to say any more, uh, any more uh, about the work you're doing outside of Palestine and the broader Middle East? Yeah, so we are an organization that helps kids in this region. We don't care if they're Palestinian, if they're Syrian, if they're Iraqi, if they're Lebanese or Jordanian, if they're Christian or Muslim, it doesn't make any difference. We don't ask, we don't care. We help any child who needs help. Now, our main focus is Palestine, obviously. This is where we started, this is where I live, this is where we have most of our offices. But we also have offices in Lebanon. We also have offices in Jordan. We're registered in Jordan. And, um, you know, I've been to Syria a couple of times before the war. I we're very, very saddened. And um, I think everybody in the world is sympathetic to the suffering of the Syrian people over the last several years and want to do something to help. And we've been able to provide humanitarian aid and humanitarian support for Syrian children as well. So our organization, and we've done that for Iraqi kids as well. We've sent Iraqi children outside for free medical care. So our organization doesn't exist just here in Palestine and we don't only help Palestinian kids. We help any child in this region who comes to our attention who needs help. And we'll continue to work on that kind of, uh, fo in that focus and uh, with that human humanitarian agenda. Um, and in Lebanon, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we can do the same thing there that we do here. We send medical teams in to operate on children. We do humanitarian relief in the refugee camps and we send children outside for free care they otherwise can't get. The same in Jordan. So uh, we recognize that the struggle and the suffering of the Palestinians and people in this region isn't just in the occupied territories, it's in this, uh, uh, in this entire region and we're here to play a positive role and to help heal the, the suffering of these kids.